All right, guys, welcome back. In our lecture today, we will be talking about the rest of the very important things happening during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, our third president. Remember, he takes office after that very contentious election, the Revolution of 1800, and Jefferson is a man of contradictions. He's a man of like all these different things. That's why people love and hate Thomas Jefferson. He was a slave owner who preached equality. He was a man talking about the principles of small government and states' rights, while, as we're going to see today, he wielded enormous executive influence in the federal government. So the biggest thing that Thomas Jefferson is going to do is he's going to basically more than double the size of our country with the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and the Louisiana Purchase is a very complicated, very interesting affair. And it were, were it not for like a series of events that nobody could have predicted, this would not have happened. Um, in the Treaty of Il Defonso in 1800, Spain is actually going to sell back to France. This is the French post-revolutionary government now under the soon-to-be Emperor Napoleon. Um, Spain will sell back to France um, this territory. And remember, Spain had originally gotten this territory from France uh, back after the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War as it's known in Europe. So just to summarize, because I get this is complicated, basically France had originally claimed this land, you know, like Sierra de la Salle, he had sailed down the Mississippi back in the 1600s and claimed all this for, for France, even though never mind, there's, you know, all these Native Americans that already had this land. Um, and that's why, you know, we have La Salle Avenue here in Waco. It's, that's why, um, if you think about the six flags over Texas, right? Remember one of those flags is France. Um, so France originally had this land. After France loses really bad in the Seven Years' War, the French and any war, um, they're going to quickly gift it over to Spain. Okay, so Spain has control of this land uh, from uh, about 1763 until 1800. They control what we'll call, look on the map, the Louisiana Territory. And keep in mind, by the way, Louisiana territory, it's not just Louisiana. It's like all of this land that extends all the way to the Rocky Mountains in the West and all the way north into Canada, okay? This is a vast, massive territory. And the boundaries on the Western side, especially given how few Europeans had ventured into that land, were also very ill-defined. I mean, who knows how far West it went? Who even knew like what all was over here? Um, it was a big mystery. It was the unknown. And of course, for somebody like Thomas Jefferson, a romantic, a visionary, an idealist, um, he looks at this as like just this great undertaking, the adventure of a lifetime, to be explorers, adventurers, to go boldly where no man has gone before, right? That's the Star Trek thing. Let me see if I can, y'all you know, you know what this is? Well, I can't, I can't do it. My brother's much better at being a Trekkie than I am. But yeah, live long and prosper, right? super nerd moment. Uh, but that's that's what it means to be adventurous, to be human. Um, and so that's the background to this. Now, what's going to happen is that keep in mind, Napoleon Bonaparte and France are fighting wars with basically everybody in Europe. They do make a kind of Catholic alliance with Spain, but they got lots of enemies and he needs money very badly. He also doesn't necessarily want to give away this land. I mean, this is a vast territory. Napoleon does kind of have designs and kind of envisions having a new French empire, a new France, once again, in the Americas like they used to. Um, but the problem is that while this is going on, there is a revolution happening in the Caribbean. Now follow the mouse. Okay, down here in the Caribbean, in the West Indies, on the island of Santo Domingo, which uh, today is the Dominican Republic and Haiti, and really it's taking place in Haiti. So on this island in the Caribbean that's today Haiti, there is a revolution happening where the slaves under French control there are rising up and overthrowing their French slave masters and trying to get their freedom. So what Napoleon's grand scheme is, is that he's going to put down this Haitian revolution. Um, he's basically telling his French soldiers that he's sending over there, be as 
violent and brutal to these uprising slaves as possible. He tells them uh, to cut off their hands, kind of like Columbus did. He says, you know, butcher the children, you know, spread fear and panic, terrorize them, squash this rebellion, and make sure that they will never think to rebel again. Scare the living daylights out of them, murder anybody uh, who was involved. Uh, and these are, you know, African slaves uh, who are, you know, living terrible, terrible lives of bondage down there. Uh, when they find out that there is going to be no way for them to secure any type of peace through diplomacy, that's just going to make them fight harder. And also, there's only like uh, less than 40,000 French soldiers that are going to be fighting in the Haitian Revolution. There are like 500,000 slaves there. So they are vastly outnumbered and the slaves are willing to definitely lay down their lives for their freedom versus the French soldiers who uh, maybe not so much. So long and short of it, the Haitian Revolution is a devastating defeat for Napoleon's otherwise pristine war record. His French forces, they get their butts kicked. And um, so he doesn't have the soldiers to send over to the Louisiana territory um, to kind of secure it. Now, while this is all happening, uh, remember that we had Pickney's Treaty in 1795 under Washington, where we secured passage through New Orleans for trade down the Mississippi. Here's New Orleans. Um, and so that was a big deal. Now that Louisiana is controlled by the French, Jefferson was getting kind of nervous. Now, just keep in mind the irony here. Uh, Jefferson was a Francophile. He loved France. Remember him and Lafayette? They, they wrote the, the Declaration on the Rights of Man and the Citizen, the big French, you know, Declaration of Independence and stuff. Uh, he was all about the French Revolution and the ideals of liberty, egalité, fraternité that it was based on. But, there's always a but, Thomas Jefferson also is a brilliant political mastermind and he realized, and I guess I shouldn't like say, oh, he's so smart. A lot of people realized this at the time. If you knew anything about world politics, Spain was a dying empire, you know, ever since their defeat in 1588 of the Spanish Armada to remember Queen Elizabeth's English forces, they haven't been doing so well. It's just been kind of downhill. Um, and we'll see the final collapse of the Spanish Empire in the New World all the way in uh, 1898 when America beats the Spanish in the Spanish-American War. Uh, but right now, under Thomas Jefferson's thinking, you know, it would be a lot better if Spain controlled New Orleans and Louisiana territory than if France did because Spain was weak. Spain wouldn't really be able to do much to stop the American settlers and American, you know, uh, government as we move in and took this territory, Spain wouldn't really be able to do anything versus the French who have like the strongest military in the world at this time under Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, that's, that's like trading out the weakest European country for the strongest. And so that's why Jefferson is going to instruct his minister to France, Robert Livingston, who, remember, they go way back. Livingston was one of the editors of the Declaration of Independence. He was on the Committee of Five, Mr. Livingston. Uh, he's going to instruct his minister of France, Robert Livingston, to try to finagle a deal with Napoleon and the French government to purchase New Orleans, eh, maybe Florida. Take Florida, too, while you're at it. And he authorized almost $10 million for Livingston to pay to do this, to try to avoid any war. Okay, so we're just going to try to buy this land. Hopefully it'll be good. But that was only for the city of New Orleans and Florida. So what happens is that when Livingston approaches Napoleon about this, Napoleon actually offers the whole kit and caboodle. He basically says, take all of it. Not only New Orleans, Florida, but he says, take the entire Louisiana territory. All of this mess right here. You see, this was the United States at this time. All of this, nearly doubling the size of our country. He offers it on a golden platter, says 15, cool 15 million, and we're there. Now, uh, for all of that land, uh, just to give you an idea of how immense, how amazing a, a deal this is, that's like three cents an acre. Three cents an acre, okay, for all that. Um, so that was, that was quite the deal. Now, remember, news and communication travel very slowly at this time. It takes months for communication between Washington, D.C. and Paris, France, uh, to go back and forth. So Livingston, let's give him some credit, he seizes on the deal. He says, 
Uh, yes, yes, we will do that. Now, technically, it was like 12.25 million uh, purchase price. And then they worked out also like 3.75 million to settle the old debts. And the debts go way back to like the Revolutionary War. Um, but altogether, $15 million and we got it. We got it made in the shape. We got all of this land. Now, meanwhile, when Jefferson does finally hear about this purchase, and, and by the way, he sent over his, his big guns, James Monroe, to help negotiate this. But by the time Monroe gets there, the deal is already basically being worked on. Livingston kind of fills him in. So technically, it's Robert Livingston and James Monroe who helped secure this deal. And Jefferson, meanwhile, he finally gets word of it back in the United States. And of course, he's excited about this. Jefferson envisions an America where every family can have their own land and be self-sufficient, you know, farmers um, in this in this democracy, this participatory participatory democracy style government. Um, but basically, everybody has their own land. They can be self-sufficient. They can they can have their own thing. Um, very different from Hamilton's vision of like you know a, the Federalist top-down controlled you know banking uh, empire kind of mauled after Britain. Um, but to do that, we had to have a lot of land. So Jefferson really likes this idea. But at the same time, he also acknowledges that as president, he's not authorized to make this deal. I mean, his, his guys, Livingston and Monroe, they're not authorized to make this deal because even him as president can't make this deal. Treaties have to be approved of by the Senate, by Congress. Um, and this is a major, major undertaking. And I mean, what it brings up all sorts of other issues. I mean, do these, does this territory eventually get uh, divided up as the Northwest Territory head, like by the, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787? Does, uh, do, who does it get ruled by? Uh, who will write its constitution? Is it gonna basically be like a colony under us? Uh, who gets to decide all these things? Because none of this is in the constitution. And Jefferson, remember, he is supposedly a very strict interpreter of the Constitution who says that you cannot do anything as president that is not explicitly mentioned word for word. It's that strict interpretation um, versus like Hamilton's loose interpretation with the necessary and proper clause. So Jefferson actually begins to have uh, his buddies in Congress draft up a constitutional amendment to basically give the government the power to make this purchase happen. Um, because he wants to go through the right channels and not be a hypocrite, basically. But while Jefferson is trying to get a new amendment to make this purchase legal, um, Napoleon starts to get cold feet and starts to rethink his decision to hastily sell off all this land. And remember, for Napoleon's part, he wants that money desperately to fight his war in Europe against the British. Um, and Napoleon has just suffered a major defeat in Haiti, losing the forces that he would have used to explore and control this territory. So for him, it was just kind of a total loss. But Napoleon's brothers and many others in France were trying to tell the future emperor, uh, sir, you're gonna regret this. France is, is losing a major, major opportunity by, by losing all this land. Um, so when Livingston and Monroe report back to Jefferson that Napoleon was starting to get cold feet, Jefferson, he rips up the, the proposed amendment and says, you know, just do it, just purchase it. We'll figure out the rest later. If we follow too closely to the law and we lose our country in the process, then what is the point of the law in the first place? Uh, to paraphrase kind of what Jefferson says about this. So that is the Louisiana Purchase, 1803, make sure you know the year. Uh, make sure you know um, all the players involved. Robert Livingston, already there, Minister to France. James Monroe, special envoy to the president. Monroe, actually, um, of course, we're going to talk a lot about him later, um, but uh, he goes heavily into debt over his uh, missions back and forth to France uh, for Jefferson, who he idolized, um, so much so that Monroe actually has to sell his personal cutlery, his silverware, his fine china, you know, the, the dishes and everything, uh, just to fund his, his voyage. Um, and will be like basically in debt the rest of his life uh, for having to pay for these travel expenses as he is not an official government capacity, he's a special envoy trusted by Jefferson. And um, 
now that we have this land, of course, uh, the political ramifications you can predict in Congress and across the country, the Federalists are very upset. Shock, right? They would be upset with something that Jefferson would do. But the many of them are saying, you know, he's a hypocrite. He just did this massive government takeover that has doubled the size of the country. And who did he consult? Who gave him the power to do this? Nobody. He just took it. Um, and so Federalists are very upset. And one of the other reasons that they're upset is that this new territory is mainly going to be populated by a lot of people who are yeoman poor, self-sufficient farmer types. They're going to be white. They're going to be of the lower class. These are people more likely to be like Jefferson supporters, Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans, not Federalists. And it's going to draw more immigrants and people like them to the United States to get this cheap available land, people that will be more likely to be Democratic Republicans. And all of this would go to hurt the future prospects of the Federalist Party. Um, and so they're, they're very not pleased. And of course, they are saying Jefferson was illegal in doing this. He didn't have any legal basis to, to make this, this purchase. They would be right. Um, now, Jefferson is excited about this on a, uh, a different level besides just politically. Um, he is a great lover of knowledge. In fact, Jefferson's library at Monticello will be upon his death. He, he had it donated to the United States government and his library, all of his many, many books will form the uh, original basis for the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. Um, so Jefferson, as a study, uh, as a fine pur purveyor, I guess you could say, of like natural science, uh, the study of plants, botany, um, zoology, all these different interests that he has, he's very excited to see what's out there and very excited to see uh, the uncharted land. Um, and for this mission to go see what is in Louisiana territory and most importantly, to try to find if there is a water route all the way to the Pacific, you know, like we've been searching for forever, um, Jefferson is going to have as the leader of this expeditionary uh, core of discovery, they were called, um, his personal secretary, Meriwether Lewis. Um, Lewis was a fellow Virginian. He was uh, a young man compared to Jefferson. And as a boy, he grew up on a farm just down the road from Monticello. Um, and so Jefferson kind of uh, took on Meriwether Lewis as sort of a, you know, uh, a father figure, kind of like Washington did for Lafayette and for Hamilton and so many others. Because remember Jefferson, um, well, he has his he has his children with Sally Hemings, but he's not able to legally acknowledge those children. Uh, memory doesn't really speak of them at all. Um, his uh, legal children, by marriage to to Martha Jefferson uh, before death, they were all daughters. Um, so he takes on Meriwether Lewis as like a, a son. And, um, and Lewis uh, was very, very gifted. He was smart, he was charming, but he, he also suffered from bouts of depression. In fact, uh, just been a decade upon this, uh, the conclusion of the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, Lewis dies a mysterious death when he was traveling on his way from being the governor of the Louisiana Territory back to Washington, DC. Um, he had had several attempted suicides and when they find his body, uh, with several gunshots, it was theorized that he probably succeeded finally committing suicide. Uh, although there were some claims that it could have as well been murder, we just don't know enough. Uh, for his co-leader of the expedition, Meriwether Lewis, is going to choose his uh, military superior from back when he was in the army, uh, a guy named William Clark, um, who was also from Virginia. Um, now, William Clark will take along his slave. He was a plantation owner. Um, his slave is going to be pretty famous on this trip as well, um, a slave named York. He was uh, a great hunter. Um, and along with Sacagawea, actually, they get to participate in um, one of the key votes on where they would winter during the expedition. Um, could be like one of the first instances of like a black man and a, a, um, a Native American woman uh, getting to basically vote in the United States. Um, now, of course, also I uh, mentioned Sacagawea, she's a Shoshone teenager. She's just 16 years old. She's like y'all's age uh, when she joins the expedition. The uh, Lewis and Clark 
expedition will last for about two years. And in that time, uh, Sacagawea, she has a young son, um, Jean Baptiste, I think his name is. Her husband was a, a French fur trapper. Um, and uh, during the course of the expedition, Sacagawea proves invaluable. She helps translate for many of the Native American tribes that the expedition comes across negotiating peace where otherwise they probably would have been killed. Um, at one point, they were about to go to uh, a battle basically with a Shoshone war chief and Sacagawea recognizes that this was her long lost brother from before she was abducted from her tribe and she reconnects and urges him to not hurt the expedition and uh, even uh, convinces her brother to grant Lewis and Clark and the two dozen or so other people with them uh, horses for them to go over the Rocky Mountains. Um, so Sacagawea was very invaluable to this mission and just again she's very young. Um, they, they start off uh, really in St. Louis, Missouri, which is why St. Louis around here is known as the uh, Gateway to the West. That's the nickname of that city. And if you go to St. Louis, Missouri today, you'll also see the, uh, the giant archway. Um, that's to commemorate the beginning of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And they kind of make their way, if you follow the mouse, uh, all through here exploring. Uh, the Spanish were very, very nervous about uh, what claims these American uh, explorers might make. And so the Spanish actually sent a mission of their own to try to intercept them and stop them. Uh, but luckily they got as lost as Lewis and Clark did and never, never found them. Uh, but they, they make their way through the Dakotas, pick up Sacagawea, um, they make their way across the Rockies and they never quite find the, the water source they were hoping to. Um, they eventually uh, get across here and they find the Columbia River and they're going to uh, see the Pacific Ocean. Now they're not the first to do this. There was an earlier uh, British expedition through Canada that had made it all the way across the continent from east to west. Uh, but they're the first Americans to do this. And of course, Meriwether Lewis, as the protege of Thomas Jefferson, had actually been through uh, Jefferson's boot camp uh, to learn all of the, uh, the, the natural sciences that he would need for this. And so he, he kept extensive records of every plant and animal and Native American society that they came across. Um, and this will all be very invaluable information when he brings that back to, to Jefferson. Um, and they eventually make their way back. They only lost one person on the entire expedition and he died uh, probably from a burst appendix. Um, and that was the Lewis and Clark expedition, a great voyage of discovery. And for lasting impact, even though they never found a water route to the Pacific, they proved it was out there, kind of setting America on its way towards this idea of manifest destiny or that we as Americans have a God-given right for, uh, to extend from sea, there's the East Coast, to Shining Sea, the West Coast, um, which of course will be a very damaging um, realization for the many, many Native Americans that still occupied the Western lands. All right, now, yeah, Thomas Jefferson, he, the, the small government states rights, remember the uh, Virginia and Kentucky resolutions they wrote at the uh, Alien and Sedition Acts? This small government states rights, Thomas Jefferson just did a massive government thing. Meanwhile, his vice president is going to be doing some really bad stuff. Uh, so remember, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, they hate each other in a rivalry that goes way, way, way back. Um, they'd both been in the Revolutionary War. They'd both commanded troops. Uh, both had gone to politics from New York. Um, and Aaron Burr in the election of 1800 had become the vice president. Remember Hamilton is barred from ever becoming vice president or president because he was born in the Caribbean. And remember they threw that little addendum into the constitution basically just to make sure Hamilton could not become president. That you must be born in the United States or an American citizen, which is funny because they were all born under British rule, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but regardless, uh, that's when the animosity is going to get ratcheted up. And there was an earlier incident under Washington's presidency um, when uh, Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law, uh, Mr. Sh uh, Schuyler, um, is going to run for office and Aaron Burr basically makes sure he he does not win and says some nasty things. Uh, that kind of is the kickoff. 
uh, the election of 1800 lit the fire. Because remember, um, Jefferson only was able to win in the tie in the House of Representatives because the lame duck Federalists there uh, threw their weight behind him due to Alexander Hamilton's urgings. And why did Hamilton support his rival Jefferson? Well, because he hated Burr even more. And he saw Jefferson as the lesser of two evils. He said, uh, Jefferson has beliefs, Burr has none. Support Jefferson. So Burr has every right to basically blame Hamilton for not, be not being able to become president of the United States. Um, and then uh, in 1804, when Jefferson is set to run for re-election, it became pretty apparent to everyone, including Aaron Burr, that he was not going to be asked to become the vice president once again. Jefferson was going to replace him. Remember, Jefferson's not exactly thrilled with Aaron Burr, who had campaigned against him in 1800, going openly door to door, canvassing for votes. Um, so, and they were political rivals that due to, you know, before the 12th Amendment had been made president VP. So Jefferson's going to drop Burr. Burr knows he's about to be without a job, so he decides to run for governor of New York. Um, and that's where this is going to get really ugly. There's a series of letters, open letters published for the public to read, that are going to happen between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, where they basically just say every nasty, nasty thing you can about the other. Hamilton continues to deride the character and honor of Burr, saying that he's duplicitous and a snake, uh, that he'll say whatever, you know, you want to get elected, but he doesn't mean anything. He doesn't have any substance. Uh, Aaron Burr uh, will fire back and eventually demand honor. So Aaron Burr will challenge Alexander Hamilton to a duel over the slights, the insults that Hamilton has lodged at him. So this has been a long time in coming. And don't forget, there was, there's also this torrid affair. Oh, in 1801 also, um, Alexander Hamilton's, uh, there was the Reynolds affair in, in the early 1790s. Uh, uh, but in 1801, Alexander Hamilton's eldest son, Philip Hamilton, uh, was actually murdered in a duel um, in the same place where Aaron Burr and, and Alexander Hamilton himself are going to duel. Um, uh, what's it called? Woboken? I can't pronounce the name of it, but it's in New Jersey because everything was legal in New Jersey, only it actually wasn't. Dueling was illegal. Um, well, that was the common duel spot. You go to Jersey. Um, but yeah, uh, Philip Hamilton, uh, Alexander's son, had died in the exact same spot that he's going to just, uh, just a few years earlier. So that's the background. Um, now it's common in these dueling situations that uh, both duelists would uh, have a second, a person to kind of take over if needs be. There would also be a doctor on standby, you know, in case somebody got hurt. Um, so there's, there's witnesses, but they weren't allowed to actually be witnesses because what they're doing, dueling was illegal in both New York and New Jersey. So when they arrive, the seconds and the other people present, including the doctor, were um, asked to, and they did, turn around so that they, uh, they could say that they didn't see any, any wrongdoing. And, um, you know, both parties kind of take their, their spots uh, and then they fire. And the witnesses reported two shots of indeterminable length uh, from each other. Um, they don't know who fired first, but uh, most of the reports go down that Alexander Hamilton had fired up into the air over Aaron Burr's shoulder and into the tree above him, which Alexander Hamilton was a pretty decent shot. It stands to reason that he probably didn't mean to actually hit Aaron Burr, because he could have if he wanted. Um, in most of these duels, you could you know, demand your honor, and then you could get satisfaction by simply showing up and then firing your pistol into the ground. Um, and that way you've proven that you have the courage to show up and potentially risk your life, and then all everything would be settled. Now, Alexander Hamilton might have played with Burr a little bit, even if this had been his intention, and he told everybody this was what he was doing. I mean, he put on his reading glasses, you know, maybe to take, to take aim a little better. Um, he kind of looked down the site and checked his pistol and, you know, kind of was making Aaron Burr real nervous. 
And then um, instead of firing into the ground, which was a commonly held practice that Air Burr probably would have recognized, he, you know, levels his gun at Burr and then fires up. Now, if you're in a duel and both participants are supposed to fire, you know, at the same time, your life is at stake, maybe Burr did think that Hamilton insisted on killing him. And that's why Burr is actually just going to shoot Hamilton right there uh, in the stomach. Uh, I think right above his right hip bone, it, it lodges in Hamilton's uh, organs through his ribs uh, and Hamilton will die an agonizing death uh, the next day, um, surrounded by his family and, and friends. Um, very similar death to his, his son, Philip, just uh, three years earlier. So Alexander Hamilton, our nation's first Secretary of the Treasury, has just been shot and killed by our nation's current sitting Vice President, Aaron Burr. Wow, that just happened. Uh, so what does Aaron Burr do? Well, first off, he's got to see if he is going to be um, under charges of murder in New York, New Jersey. Um, that kind of drops, and then he resigns as vice president, and then he's going to go out west. Um, and in New Orleans, he's actually going to meet and befriend James uh, Wilkinson, known as Agent X, because this American... Uh, officer was actually a Spanish spy, and the two of them will uh, basically plot treason. They will plot to have Western territories uh, break away from the United States. Um, the British, uh, their, their uh, diplomat kind of gets mixed in this as well, um, but eventually uh, Jefferson is informed, um, Wilkinson betrays him, uh, betrays Burr and informs Jefferson uh, of what Burr's actions are, that he's plotting to basically lead a, a civil war. Um, and Jefferson has his agents go out and arrest Aaron Burr, the, the former vice president, and put him on trial before the Supreme Court. So Judge uh, John Marshall is presiding over the case of the former vice president who is being indicted for treason to the United States, trying to plot uh, you know, Western secession. They ruled him not guilty for insufficient evidence. Uh, Burr will go to Europe and then back to the United States and return to his law office in New York and kind of live the rest of his life in obscurity. But that was a very uh, interesting chapter in American history. And because Hamilton is dead, now the Federalist Party uh, they've taken a real hit. Remember, Hamilton was the leader, basically, of the Federalists. Without him, we're going to see, especially um, through the War of 1812 and, and at its conclusion, that's kind of the end of the Federalists. Now, Burr, also Aaron Burr, that was the end of his political career. Obviously, he's not kind of, he's not going to be coming back from that. And George Clinton will be named as Thomas Jefferson's second vice president. Meanwhile, in 1805, you have the Battle of Trafalgar happening, where Lord Horatio Nelson with the British fleet will prove their dominance of the seas over Napoleon, Spanish, and French combined navy. This was a huge victory for the British, like enormous. It secured their Britannia rules the seas moniker and is basically going to guarantee that Britain has control of the oceans. They rule, they rule the, the ships uh, from now until the world wars in the, the 20th century. Um, Nelson dies a heroic death during the middle of the battle. He used uh, new uh, modern naval tactics and, and all this stuff. But for what it means for the United States, um, obviously Napoleon won't be invading uh, Britain, uh, but what it means for us is that uh, Britain now is not going to be as worried about competing with the French, um, and they can start to ramp up their impressment of American sailors, because that great navy that Britain has, it needs a lot of men to fuel it, a lot of sailors, and they intend King George III, there he is again, he is uh, actually ordering that British ships seize American ships and board them and kidnap or impress as many American sailors as they can, claiming that these are uh, British sailors who have run away and shirked their duties. 
Well, and by the way, I just remembered something really interesting. I was reading about this. Um, apparently, when um, when Thomas Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis to his uh, natural sciences boot camp training in Philadelphia, one of the things he warned uh, Lewis that he might encounter in his uh, Corps of Discovery expedition to the, the Louisiana Territory was uh, woolly mammoths. Um, he thought woolly mammoths might be out there and all kinds of other like crazy things. Uh, but I thought that was interesting. Of course, they don't find woolly mammoths, but Meriwether Lewis does discover grizzly bears, coyotes, all those sorts of things. Okay, now back to the British and the French of it all. Um, we are in a rock and a hard place as the United States. Um, while the British are ramping up their impressment of American sailors and authorizing this terrible practice, um, you also have the French under Napoleon saying that America is not allowed to and no other country is allowed to trade with Britain. Of course, France can't enforce this, but any French ships out there, they are fully authorized to, again, board American ships, take us over if they think that we're trading with Britain. So basically, we can't trade with Britain or we'll be in trouble with France and we can't send our ships out and do anything with the French or we'll be taken over by the British ships. So we can't really do much. <laughs> and then in 1807, uh, you have the uh, Chesapeake Leopard Affair. And this is where a British ship, the Leopard, is going to attack the American ship, the Chesapeake, uh, off our own coastal waters. It fires uh, several dozen volleys into our ship demands to board, it finally boards. Uh, 18 sailors were injured, three American sailors were killed, um, and they, they kidnap or impress several of our sailors. Now, this is an act of war. Firing on our own ship without provocation is an act of war, but Jefferson doesn't want to go to war because A, America can't hope to fight the British Navy. We don't have the gunpowder, we don't have the ships. There's no way we could win that war. Um, and again, we have all these problems with the British and the French, so Jefferson's left with really no alternative, and most people understood this, but to do an embargo. An embargo is where you refuse to do all trade. So no one in America, no business, no planter, no factory, no manufacturer, no nothing will be allowed to be exported. Likewise, Nobody will be allowed to import anything. No imports or exports, period. That is an embargo. Now, this is going to lead to a lot of hardship for average Americans. Um, there's many people that write to Jefferson, uh, you know, this is nearing the end of his second term, 1807, 1808, uh, saying, you know, that they've lost their children to starvation. Their kids are literally starving to death because we're not getting those uh, European imports that America really relied on at this time. Jefferson, at the beginning, he tried to be positive about this, saying that, ironically, again, Thomas Jefferson of the South and the planter class and the yeoman farmer, he says, well, this could be good. Maybe it'll force America to have to manufacture more. Um, but really, it's, it's going to kind of starve the country, and everybody's really not going to like it. Uh, it puts us in a really hard place. And, and what was it for? Well, because we couldn't go to war. So presumably it was for peace to avoid war, but we're going to be going into war anyway, just, you know, five years later, the War of 1812. So a lot of people see the embargo as kind of a failure, but I think if, if you look at it also contextually, like look at it at the time, look at what was happening. Could America have gone to war in 1807? No, maybe it just like the Jay's Treaty of 1795, maybe we should look at this more in a positive light that it gave us the time we needed to get ready so that when the time came for war, we would be ready and we wouldn't fall apart. We would be able to keep our country together. Um, but that's maybe a little bit half too full. All right, and uh, Jefferson, by this point, 
he's going to pull a Washington and basically say he's tired. He's given over 30 years of his life to public service. Maybe he didn't fight in any wars, but he did an awful lot of trips back and forth to Europe. He penned the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he served as Secretary of State. He served as Vice President, as President now for eight years. He wants to retire to Monticello, go home, step down, you know, be finished with this, this public life. And so, um, Jefferson, this is kind of critical, by following Washington's footsteps of stepping down after his second term, will kind of solidify that as, as a, you know, it's not an official rule, but an unofficial rule that presidents step down after two terms. And every president until Franklin Roosevelt during the Great Depression and World War II will follow Jefferson and Washington's lead. Um, and then we'll get the 22nd Amendment that puts that as a constitutional law, the president stepped down after their second term. Um, he was still enormously popular, even with the terrible embargo, making people starve to death. Um, Jefferson, master politician, remember he kind of kept his, he kept his fingers out of everything. So people didn't really know how much he was actually like behind the scenes, manipulating all the events that were happening. Um, and then his chosen protege, uh, the little guy, the father of the Constitution, the Secretary of State under Jefferson, James Madison, will inherit the presidency. He'll be elected uh, pretty comfortably in the election of 1808. Now, for what we should remember of Thomas Jefferson's presidency, Louisiana Purchase, first and foremost. Yes, there is hypocrisy there. There is irony there. Um, but that is like the man himself. Jefferson embodied the hypocrisy of America, embodied the good and bad of our country, and the hopes, the ideals, and the downfalls that we have. He's a man, like I said, who talked about the equality of all mankind. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. You know, he wrote those words at the same time, he owned many slaves and refused to free them during his lifetime um, at Monticello. Um, Jefferson was a man who believed in the principle of small government and states' rights, but only when it suited him, as we saw with the Louisiana Purchase. Um, he was a man who, who believed in uh, staying out of, of the government directing you know, internal revenue, uh, the government directing business, but yet... He does the boldest uh, economic action that we've seen thus far with the embargo. So Jefferson's legacy is very complicated, uh, but America would not be the same without him. So I'll leave you to decide for yourselves how we should view him. With that being said, we'll go ahead and end our lecture for today. When we uh, come back for the next one, we'll be talking about James Madison, little guy, and we'll be talking about the war that is going to start in 1812, but will not finish until 1850. Thank you, guys. Bye.